Welcome to the NBA Daily for October 22nd, 2024. I'm Dave DeFore here with S. Barahenny. Coming up, we take a look at the deadline day rookie extensions. Timberwolves beat writer John Krasinski stops by to take a look at the Wolves' upcoming season. Then we preview opening night. Good morning and welcome to the NBA Daily. We got some big news around the NBA with Monday's rookie extension deadline. We got opening night tonight. S. Oh, yeah. Oh, man, there's a lot happening. We even got some injury news, which, you know, we'll just get to that tomorrow because we got to hit these extensions. I thought a fun way to kind of go through these extensions instead of doing a breakdown for everything, every single sure. one. Uh, the Jalen Green is, is a very interesting deal. Uh, I thought a fun way would be let's put these things in the Goldilocks zone. So you and I are going to go through them. You tell me, is it too high? Is it too low? Or is this deal just right? Let's start with uh, Shingun. Five years, $185 million, player option on the fifth year. Too high, too low, or just right? To be honest with you, I I say too low. Um, I think this is a guy who could have got the max if he waited until this summer. I think he very well could have got the max. This is a guy who was third in most improved award voting last year. He had 21, nine and five. Uh, he took a major leap, was in the all-star conversation in the West. And that says a lot because the West is crowded in terms of all-stars. So I think this is a guy who could have got a max in the summer, but Hey, I guess, I guess he wanted that guaranteed money and the player option helps, right? Because he, he kind of gave up about $40 million by not taking that max and waiting until the summer. But that player option helps him eventually get more down the road. Yeah, and he won't have to think about restricted free agency on that next deal. Jalen Green, 3106. Yep. I mean, two years, and then he gets a chance to opt out. Um, also, it's a nice little $30 million contract if Houston decides they wanted to move on from him this summer. And that's, you know, fifth starter money, and he's a pretty good player. Too high, too low, or just right? I'm going to say too high, but just by a tad. I mean, I could I could do the shoulder shrug and really just not know with this because this, again, it's a bet from both sides. Jalen Green hasn't proved that he is deserving of this level of money, you know, contractually. But when it comes to what he can potentially be, sure, it's just right. But right now, too high. All right. Um, Orlando Magic guard Jalen Suggs gets a five-year, $150 million deal. This is a huge bet on a guy who shot 40% from three last year, but only 75% from the free throw line, that he's going to continue to be somewhere yeah. around a 40% three-point shooter. Is this too high, too low, or just right? Second team all defense member, one of the most impactful defenders last season for one of the best defenses in the league in the Orlando Magic. I think this is just right, especially when you consider that the cap percentage is going up. Uh, the cap itself is going to be going up and the percentage of the cap for this deal just is is perfectly right for a guy who likely is going to be a fourth or fifth starter on your team. Uh, it makes sense for me. I think this is just right. Aaron Gordon and the Denver Nuggets have agreed to a four-year, $133 million opt-in and extend contract extension. Uh, there's a player option in 2028, 2029, and S, there's also a trade kicker. They gave him everything they possibly could. The buffet, the Lambo. I'm assuming there's a lot of incentives involved in this as well. Maybe being able to get access to the premium lounge. All the type of stuff that you would want Aaron Gordon was able to get because the Nuggets weren't in a position to negotiate. Um, realistically, it was either re-sign him or let him walk and not have the room or the flexibility to replace a guy like Aaron Gordon, who has been vital and essential to everything that they've been able to do over this contention window with Nikola Jokic. You think of the defense and how he's been able to anchor them next to a guy like Jokic, the offensive connection that he has next to Jokic, going to Serbia and watching horses with Nikola Jokic also. Like this is a guy who is it like intrinsic and essential to everything they do. It's a no-brainer and and it's also just right for me in terms of the contract. Yeah, uh being best friends with Nikola Jokic, fruitful. <laughs> they yeah. would say, all right, give me perks. a Goldilocks yeah. rating on, on this extension. Just right. Just right. Look, people will be shocked that it's max value in those three years. But again, I think for a guy who's like your third best starter, maybe fourth best, depending on how you feel about Michael Porter Jr., I think that's just right. Four years, $112 million in New Orleans for Trey Murphy the third. I mean, this feels like a steal to me. I'm going to say this is a perfect deal for them. What do you think? 
Yeah, it's just right. Uh, Look, Trey hasn't been the healthiest player. Last season just played 57 games. He's going into this season with an injury as well. But I think when you look at his potential, he has all the makings of a three-level score. Incredible shooter, attacks closeouts well, great at getting to the rim. It's just about finding ways to get those opportunities and also please to the New Orleans Pelicans, commit to starting the man this year. Just do it. Don't think about it. Don't overthink it. Just start Trey Murphy no matter what. And a guy that probably needs some playing time, Moses Moody with the Golden State Warriors, three years, 39 million. Just right to me. Yeah, I think it's just right too. I I also think he just has the opportunity to play this year. We've talked about the Warriors depth and how, you know, they've got 11 guys who can play on any given night. I mentioned 11 because I think Moses Moody is rightfully in that conversation. Uh, He's been good through preseason. Think he has a chance to play some really big minutes. What this means for the rest of the guys on the roster in the Wiggins, in the Pajimskis, Kaminga didn't get a contract extension. You know, we'll see what happens with that. But I, I think it's just right for Moody. Yeah, and the Warriors have a lot of guys. This contract could make it, so a consolidation trade makes a little bit more yeah. sense for them. Uh, Corey Kispert in Washington, four years, $54 million. That's a steal. It's too low, man. I know, look, it, it'll it'll come back and everybody's going to say Corey Kisper is the media darling for everybody, but this is just good business by the Wizards to get these guys on very high-value contracts. You think of the Jonas Valanciunas contract this summer. You think of the Kyle Kuzma contract before that. These are all tradable deals for guys that could be impactful on different teams. And so you think about locking these guys up. I didn't even mention Denny Avdia, which was another guy that they locked up and, and then traded. I think this is something that's like hey we like Corey Kispert we like what he has but maybe we can flip him down the road for something else as well yeah and the last couple that rolled in Jalen Johnson five years 150 again kind of a similar situation to Suggs and and, you know Shingun where we know what this guy is and I think that's good fifth starter money for him and then Jaden Hardy three years 18 million um you know hey not too bad Backup point guard money, right? Like that, they they believe in him now, especially with Tim Hardaway gone. It's this is the guy who's going to be running the ship once Luca and Kyrie are are off the floor. Makes sense. Coming up after the break, we asked John Krasinski if the Wolves got better with the Carl Anthony Towns trade. My initial reaction to the Carl Anthony Towns trade was that the Minnesota Timberwolves definitely got worse. Now, in in the last few weeks, I've had a chance to think about it, and now I'm not so sure. John Krasinski, our beat reporter for the Minnesota Timberwolves and the host of the John Krasinski Show, is here to explain to me why the Wolves got better. John, did they get better? It's great. It's a great question, Dave, and I will say it has been very telling to me that the way that they have messaged this trade has been very intentional. And I think when the when it first comes about, it breaks on that Friday night on the September 27th, and you, you, your initial reaction is, well, they had to get rid of salary. And, man, they're just coming off of a Western Conference Finals run, and Cat was a big part of that. And, and now this is this new, smaller market, can't compete kind of a thing. And, and so they have to rejigger their roster and – um, and, and just kind of get under a luxury tax. But um, from the moment uh, I've talked to either people on the record or off the record within the Timberwolves, it has been, no, this was as much a basketball trade as it was a financial one. They would certainly acknowledge that the – financial freedoms that will be afforded them down the road are is going to help them put together a little bit more of a roster around Anthony Edwards for the long haul. But uh, they really believe in the short term that this is a better, more, a deeper team, maybe a little tougher team. Um, also, I think that it is a more conventional roster now, Dave. Like when you look at it before, they kind of zagged while everyone else was zigging. When you have Towns and Gobert together, and 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 it it took a lot of adjusting, but they did a good job with it. This iteration of the Timberwolves with Julius Randle with Dante Divincenzo is much more one, two, three, four, five, and um, I think that there is belief internally that the ball movement that the uh, overall offensive output is going to increase by quite a bit. And we will see. I'm, I'm, I'm not exactly sold on it just yet, but I see the logic in them saying, no, these pieces just fit together in a different way, maybe a little bit better than we had with Cat before. 
I mean, their defense was excellent. Their biggest problem was offensively, right? And you can see if they have an increase in three-point volume, maybe a little bit more variance. Like, we know Missoula ball works so well for the Celtics, and I think everyone's kind of paying attention to that. Just the the higher floor it can give you. I think maybe they look at that. How much of this, though, are they banking on an Anthony Edwards leap? You know, I don't even know what that looks like for the guy. 26-5-5, and and he's just turned 23 years old. I mean, is that a part of this? For sure. I think every Tim Connolly even said it before last season that every move that they make going forward is with Anthony Edwards at the heart of it. So this is all designed to try to give Anthony Edwards the best situation around him to succeed both short term and long term. I think that when people looked at the Rudy Gobert trade initially, I think there was a vast underestimation of the importance of it for Anthony Edwards. Cause right, right away you say, gosh, you know, he's this big guy. He kind of plants at the rim. He, he kind of takes a lot of the traffic um, and sucks it right towards the basket. And that's bad for Anthony Edwards. But what it really was for Anthony Edwards was it was a floor raiser that made sure the Timberwolves are competitive and that he is playing in big games early in his career. And that played out last year with Rudy. Now, it's the same way with this trade a little bit where you look at it and you say, well, you know, kind of the ideal situation for Anthony Edwards is to have a big who can space the floor and allow, give him rim, room, uh, lanes to the rim and you know pop out catch and shoot threes do kind of make it very difficult on the defense to concentrate on both of them that way. And for as individually talented as both cat and Ant are offensively, the two of them had not really clicked in a meaningful way on that end of the floor because they were number one in defense last year, but 17th in offensive efficiency. I mean, they weren't, they weren't mediocre. They were worse than mediocre. And so I do think that this trade with DiVincenzo's volume shooting, maybe with Randall as another bucket getter type of a guy, because they did not really have that in that Dallas series, maybe that gives them an, an, some more flexibility and options around Edwards than they had before. At least that's the thinking with it. I do think, Dave, it's going to take some time. Like with with Julius and, and Ant, and they both like to hold the ball, and they both like oh, to yeah. ISO a little bit, right? <laughs> yeah, so who's going to throw? Who's going to be passing on this team? That's the question I keep asking myself. Who is going to be passing aside from Mike Connolly, right? Yeah, okay, yeah. so I've, I've asked you what they feel internally. Mm -hmm. Quickly, just what do you expect out of this team this year? I mean, look, they, they made it so far last year. They, they made a huge change. What are your expectations? I mean, I, I have high expectations. I mean, when you look at I, I, it, so much of it stems from the belief in Anthony Edwards. Like, I think that they have a bankable box office, big time star. And that is what you need the most to have success in the playoffs. And the thing about Ant is... Almost every time he is in a series, he is one of the very best players, and he just has that sense of the moment. So what does a leap look like for him, you asked? It's a good question, but I think that what I expect to see from him in year five is more maturity, um, a, a, a even more vocal leadership on his part. Now that Cat is in New York, this is his team entirely. And the one really good thing about Ant from a leadership standpoint is he does not ever make it feel like his team. He just kind of grabs it and gets everyone to come along with him. And so I think that's going to, that's going to take another step. I also think that they are hoping and want to see more playmaking from him, better finishing at the rim. Um, those types of things that can help go him go from 26, 27, 28 points a game, maybe assists go to five a game, five and a half, um, sh three point shooting looks really good early on here in the preseason. Maybe that helps to kind of, uh, fill in the gap for cat, um, for the loss of cat. Uh, so I think in every facet of the game, considering that he came off of that Western conference finals run, he understood what it takes now to win and win deep in the playoffs. And then he had the Olympic experience of being around all those guys, LeBron and KD and Steph and all of them. I just think he's ready to really put his stamp on this league. And so, um, yeah, I think that I think they're a, a top four team in the West. I think they're a team that can absolutely 
depending on the right matchups, come out of the West and and, and go to the finals. So, um, you know, we'll see about that part of it. But I just think that they are a deep, talented team that has a lot going for it, starting with number five. Sounds like John Krasinski to me. Talented, <laughs> a lot right. going for you. Also, yeah. you would not have been first on my bingo card for the first guy to wear a Wu-Tang shirt on the podcast, so I wish I wish it was Wu Tang. It's oh, actually it's like a rip off. It's a, a it's, rip-off. A, it's a local oh, it's no. a local brewery. So um, <laughs> okay, that, that, well that's kind of that's kind of you know taking uh, taking the logo a little bit. I but, really uh, thought you came in here in a Wu Tang shirt. <laughs> John Krasinski, go and read his work over at the Athletic. Thank you very much for stopping by. Uh, stick around after the break. S and I are going to take a look at tonight's opening night matchups, and uh, we're also going to give our thoughts on Joe Mazzulla. We're excited around here because it's finally opening night. No more dog days of summer for us, S. We've got Nick no, Celtics no. tonight. What are you looking forward to in Nick Celtics? I mean, this is a hotly anticipated matchup. Yes, other than the fact that we just get basketball, NBA basketball back. Um, uh, the, the questions I have for the Nick Celtics game. First one, uh, Mikhail Bridges, the jump shot. Where did it go? Okay, because this was a guy who shot basically 37, 38 percent for the majority of his six year career heading into seven year seven. He is now a guy who is trying to fix his jump shot, according to the Athletics' own James Edwards, the third. He says that he's been trying to tweak his jump shot to get back to what he was in Villanova. Well, in preseason, it hasn't been successful. Two of 19 so far from three. The jump shot looks pretty bad. I'm not going to lie to you. If he's going to be tweaking it, it's going to be a question for the New York Knicks. Yeah, two of 19. He fits right in in New York. Sabrina Ionescu won (laughs) a uh, title with uh, a little bit worse than that. For me, I want to see how the Knicks attack the offensive glass. That was a key to their success last season. No Hartenstein, no Mitchell Robinson, no Dante DiVincenzo. What does it look like with Carl Anthony Towns pounding the boards? That's what I want to see. And then we got Lakers and we got Timberwolves. And, you know, I talked to John Kay. He told us what he thinks about the season coming up, the leap expected for Anthony Edwards. What are you looking forward to in this game with the Lakers and Wolves opening night? Well, first of all, I've I've loved how Dante DiVincenzo has looked in the little, limited amount of time we've seen him with the Wolves roster. Um, how much does he play into the starting lineup? Because Mike Conley is obviously getting up there in age. If Anthony Edwards is stepping in as this lead ball handler, lead playmaker, DiVincenzo makes sense as the guy next to him in the backcourt. But again, how much of that are we actually going to see? Is it going to be Conley starting for, you know, 18 minutes a night and then we get 30 minutes of DiVincenzo? What is that blend? And then there's the Julius Randle Nazareth question as well, right? Like how much of both of those guys do we get? That's my main question with the Timberwolves. Yeah, and the Wolves looking to get more three-point volume. So I expect a heavy dose of Dante DiVincenzo out there, especially with Anthony Edwards. For me, it's year 22 LeBron James. This is getting ridiculous at this point. He's going to be 40 this season. I don't know if you know that, S. Uh, Crazy. Getting up there, almost my age, as if my age <laughs> isn't going to continue to stay ahead of his. Uh, but it's it's a great storyline. I mean, it's something to watch. I loved yeah. his Olympic run. The stuff with Bronny James has been pretty fun in the preseason. Um, you yeah. know, uh, whatever you feel about team building, uh, it's been an interesting side note. So I'm looking forward to see what does LeBron have left in the tank as we get into his 22nd season in the NBA, which again, absurd. It, it doesn't even make sense. I mean, we should we should be grateful of the fact that he is even playing this long and also playing at the level he is for this long. It Again, absurd is a great way to put it because it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. And uh, finally, a little bit of fun from Joe Mazzulla at Celtics practice. He was asked about the pressure that the Celtics feel going into a title defending season. And he had this to say about it. It's not pressure. There's nothing anyone in this circle can do to me that's going to impact my identity and who I am as a person or a coach. We're either going to win or we're not, and 40 years from now, none of you are invited to my funeral, and that's it. Now, as I got to thinking about this. Okay. I thought it was hilarious, of course, but uh, I wanted to know yeah. from you, what three people do you think Joe Mazzulla definitely has on his funeral invitation list? <laughs> okay, well, first of all, it's a great question. Joe Mazzulla, by the way, becoming like an incredible all-time level professional sports all-time quote. Like, quote. Yeah, it's, it's great. But I, I have to say, Ben Affleck, Jeremy Renner, 
and Rebecca Hall from the town. <laughs> Though, I think they all get an invite. You know, he's a big fan of the town. He's watched it like over a million times. You know, he watches it at halftime. He watches it post game. Apparently, he watches it before games as well. I think it's I think it's the cast of the town. I think they get the invite. There's one right answer here. Okay. That's Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. That's going to do it for today's show, folks. <laughs> Don't forget, our email address is nbadaily at theathletic.com. Shoot us your opening week questions. We're going to do a mailbag later on in a week. Please rate and review us on iTunes, Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts. And go on and check out No Dunks, our partner show here at The Athletic. For S. Barahenny, I'm Dave DeFore, and this has been the NBA Daily. Thanks for waking up with us. Mm-hmm.